right, we will get started this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dean Jessica Berg, and this is our annual Schroeder Lecture. I'm going to hand the podium directly over to the director of our Law Medicine Center and um, eminent uh, uh, professor here, uh, Max Melman, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, welcome to the 2018-2019 Schroeder Lecture. The lecture is named for Oliver C. Schroeder, who joined the faculty of what was then the Western Reserve Law School in 1948, and in 1953 founded the Law Medicine Center as the first law school health, health law program in the country. Uh, by the terms of the charter of the lectureship, which was established uh, in Ollie's honor when he retired in 1986, the Schroeder Scholar-in-Residence is selected on the basis of, quote, scholarly distinction and contribution in the arenas of health policy and law. <clears throat> Sorry. Our 2018-2019 Schroeder Scholar is Sarah Rosenbaum. Professor Rosenbaum attended Wesleyan University and Boston University of Law School. Upon graduating law school, she joined Vermont Legal Aid as a staff attorney, she then moved to Los Angeles, where she joined the National Health Law Program, which advocates for the health needs of low-income and underserved individuals and families. While there, Professor Rosenbaum was instrumental in getting Medicaid to establish community health centers, which now provide primary care for almost 30 million people. In 1979, Professor Rosenbaum was recruited by Marion Wright Edelman, who was the recipient, by the way, of Case Western Reserve's Inamori Prize for Ethical Leadership in 2017. And Professor Rosenbaum moved to Washington, D.C. to join Marion's Children's Defense Fund. There, she pressed Congress to require Medicaid to cover low-income pregnant women without children and to require hospitals to treat pregnant women in need of emergency care regardless of their ability to pay. While at the Children's Defense Fund, Professor Rosenbaum also got to know Hillary and Bill Clinton. And when Bill became president, Professor Rosenbaum joined the White House Domestic Policy Council, where she oversaw the drafting of the Clinton health reform proposal, the Health Security Act. This puppy. <laughs> Professor Rosenbaum then went to George Washington University, where she joined the Public Health and Management Department and founded the Hirsch Health Law and Policy Program at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Since then, she has helped enact the Children's Health Insurance Program in 1997, which provided affordable coverage for children and families with incomes above Medicaid limits. She served on numerous prestigious advisory committees and groups, including the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and the Medicaid and CHIP, Children's Health Insurance Program Payment and Access Commission, MACPAC, which advises Congress on federal Medicaid policy and which she chaired. Meanwhile, she found time to co-author a leading case book in health law. It's my profound pleasure to welcome such a distinguished teacher, scholar, policymaker, and advocate as the Schroeder Scholar, and to hear her talk today entitled, The Almost Great Unraveling, Can the Quest for Solidarity Survive? Please join me in welcoming Sarah Rosenbaum. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for for having me, Professor Melman, uh, and uh, this wonderful program. Uh, this is the uh, really the, the, the granddaddy of all uh, uh, health law programs, um, and you are very fortunate to have it here. Uh, even before I knew there was such a thing as, as, as university health law programs, I, I knew this program. And uh, I am a great follower of everything that Professor Melman um, uh, uh, writes. So it really is a, a wonderful treat to be able to come out here today. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you about Medicaid, uh, an article that was pu it's based on an article that was published in the Journal of Health Politics, Policy, and Law uh, this past uh, spring. Um, and it took me about a year and a half to write the article because, of course, it was one of those articles um, uh, that was being written in real time uh, as, the, as, as the Medicaid program was going through its most recent version of crash and burn. Uh, and, and, and once again, as Medicaid has done over decades now, sort of pulled itself out uh, and uh, we're back into um, the same sort of extraordinary uh, uh, period of achievement and yet uncertainty uh, for, for the program. 
Uh, and of course, one can talk about Medicaid as a, a such an important um, law. It is the largest insurer in the United States. Uh, it serves about 75 million people now. Uh, it program has been quite epic here in Ohio because of your governor's decision uh, to forge ahead uh, at a time when the pressure on him was actually quite immense not to not to do so. Uh, and uh, uh, while there have been many scraps and scrapes around the program, it has uh, you, you sort of have been able to see it in its um, uh, in its drama side here in Ohio, as well as uh, as well as its its role in the health care system. Um, so I did, wrote the article. It took about a, it took about a year to write the article, and then of course the normal. Uh, you know, months-long editing process, but it was one of those articles which, as as I was writing it, I really felt as if I had spent, well, now about 44 years writing this article. Um, so, I, as as Professor Melman said, I, um, I began my career as a legal services lawyer, uh, and it happened that uh, at the time. Of course, the Legal Services Corporation was quite new, and our funding came from the Legal Services Corporation, but also at that point, other federal agencies were pouring money into local legal services programs, and I actually was funded under an Older Americans Act uh, award, which meant all of my clients were old, uh, just like I am today, uh, they were about, the same, about the same age. And, uh, uh, but, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't grow into old age with the with the great good fortune that that I've had, and most people um, uh, in this room probably have had uh, or will have. Uh, they were quite sick, uh, and uh, everybody who walked through the door came through the door with an issue that turned out to be a Medicaid issue. Actually, Medicaid and Medicare uh, together, but Medicaid really was the predominant issue because even back in its early days, this was in the first ten years of the program. It was obvious, even to a 24-year-old, uh, that Medicaid was paying for things that Medicare would not pay for. It did things that Medicare didn't do, uh, and uh, it was it was the way that most of my clients, who were very medically underserved, Vermont was not yet the gorgeous destination spot it is today. It was very poor. It was really the you know the northern tier of Appalachia. Mm -hmm. Uh, at, at that point, anything above Putney, if you know, if you know uh, New England at all, you know Putney was always beautiful, and then you would go beyond that, and life sort of got a lot harder. Um, and I sort of developed early on this this love affair with the program, not really understanding why, uh, and it's taken me decades of working in the field of health insurance to understand why this program is so remarkable. Um, why the program is as big as it is, uh, why the program is as complicated as it is, why it is as revered and despised at the same time as it is. And it's sort of a, a paradigm of a particular set of decisions when it comes to how we deal with health and welfare issues in the United States. Uh, it shows uh, our extreme eagerness to use the powers of government uh, to do things that absolutely have to be done in any health system, at the same time um, uh, underscoring the e extreme otherness with, 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 with which the poor are held uh, and isolated in the United States. Uh, and these two, these two themes sort of come together over and over in the program. They, they make it sore, and yet they make it very vulnerable. Um, when I am asked sort of to, to, descri to describe Medicaid, and of course this is a big fight going on now, uh, I, I would tend to describe Medicaid as public health insurance. Uh, but there are a lot of people who will not describe Medicaid that way. They describe it as welfare uh, <clears throat> uh, because of its underlying structure uh, as a grant and aid program based on income and, and, and medical impoverishment. Uh, but um, there is no question that it plays the role that health insurance plays, um, uh, and it does many things better than health insurance, our health insurance, probably most of us in this room, uh, including Medicare, um, do uh, at the same time it, 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 it's very vulnerable. Um, 
so when I think about the program, I have said to people, well, you know, the thing that makes it such a remarkable program is that whereas if you think about commercial health insurance, um, employer plans, the individual market now in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, um, <clears throat> and even Medicare, um, those are all programs that are sort of hothouse flowers. There's a lot we have to do to create the conditions under which they can they can operate. And of course, we've all gotten a master class in this in the wake of the Affordable Care Act. I mean, if you look at what is happening to try and keep the individual insurance market, let's say, a functional market, um, the number of backstops that are required, the very careful attention to risk um, and risk segmentation, um, the the requirements that are imposed, uh, the the uh, uh, the the you know almost uh, 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 zero focus on on this question of risk pooling and 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 how do we build a risk pool and how do we offset uh, the 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 frailties of a risk pool? We don't have to have those discussions with Medicaid. <laughs> Medicaid, of course, is not built on the principles of risk financing. It is public health financing. It is a public health and welfare statute. Uh, it is built. It is built to embrace risk. It's not built to run away from risk. Um, it is built to embrace risk, uh, and I have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it is that makes it built to embrace risk. And the issue really is how it's financed. It's not a premium-based program. Um, it's not um, a program where it matters at any given time um, how many, what the ratio of health need people to, to healthy people are. In fact, the sicker and more vulnerable you are, the more likely it is you're going to end up in Medicaid. So it's very basic financing mechanism and the fact that it's general revenue. At the state level, not so true. At the state level, there is always general revenue, but there are usually a lot of dedicated taxes. Uh, and so the growth of the program is much more uh, susceptible to checks and balances than it has been at the federal level, actually. But at the federal level, it's a general revenue program. Uh, and given the vast size of the federal budget, you know, if you really want to spend some money on health care, um, there's Medicaid. You can put money into it. It's quite elastic. And furthermore, the program is designed to essentially embrace every kind of health condition, every kind of person, every kind of system health need that the commercial market, even a generous commercial market, um, the Medicare system cannot absorb, um, not without a radical transformation of, of the financial basis for the program. And so, of course, we have seen this over and over and over again, and it's what explains the size of the program. Um, it is, as we all know, uh, an insurer of the poor. Uh, if you have income here in Ohio uh, below 138% of the federal poverty level, uh, and um, uh, we're going to see whether you also have to meet other other new eligibility restrictions uh, that are are pending in Washington. But um, uh, if you have income below 138 percent of poverty, um, and you are a working age adult or a child, you are eligible for the program, assuming you reside in the state and you're lawfully present and all those other good things. But it's just now. It's clearly functioning as a health insurance program for hundreds of thousands of people here. Um, and it does all the things that health insurance does. The network is probably different. Provider access for specialty care may be somewhat different. Um, but in most um, respects, um, uh, putting aside the very serious issue of provider payment structures, um, uh, the program functions like insurance. Uh, but, of course, that's only the starting point for Medicaid. It is also the mechanism that we've chosen to use in the U.S. because of Medicare's frailty to make Medicare affordable to low-income people um, and to fill in the pieces that Medicare simply is not structured to fund. So it's Medicare, it's Medicaid that buys coverage for Medicare beneficiaries who are low-income. It's Medicaid, of course, that provides long-term services and supports. 
And until relatively recently, it was Medicaid that provide, provided prescription drug coverage. That, that shifted, obviously, in, uh, in the early 2000s. Um, it is also Medicaid plays roles that are much more structural and systemic. For example, it is the biggest single source of financing for what we call the health care safety net for community health centers, for, for, for clinics serving women uh, and funded through the federal family planning program, um, public hospitals, uh, large mission-driven hospitals. Uh, any provider that has the, um, either by mission or by obligation, um, the responsibility of anchoring health care in poor communities is there today because of Medicaid. Today, for example, um, community health centers, you have, of course, many of them in Ohio, um, community health centers are deriving about half their revenue from the Medicaid program, at least in expansion states. In non-expansion states, not quite so much, but even there, um, Medicaid is the thing that makes a health center able to open its doors. Same is true for family planning, um, and the same is true for every children's hospital in a state. Uh, if you've ever used a children's hospital for your child, um, that hospital's doors are open, not so much because of commercially insured people, but because of the role of Medicaid in financing pediatrics. And pediatrics are about half Medicaid today. Half of all births in the U.S. are Medicaid. These are, you know, at that level we're talking about population health. We're talking system and structure. We're no longer just talking about the role as an individual insurer. It is the reason we have long-term services and supports in this country. We don't have it because of commercial insurance. We don't have it because of Medicare. Um, we have these things because we've grown the Medicaid program. It's the reason why we had any sort of an effective HIV response um, during the, the great epidemic. Uh, it's the reason why we're going to have a response, however halting, to the opioid crisis. Uh, it is the thing everybody turns to again and again when, the, when of course, every hurricane um, that we've had in the past 20 years has hit. Every state has turned to Medicaid for special permission to insure people who otherwise wouldn't have coverage. Uh, uh, it played an absolutely existential role in Katrina, for example. I, I don't know what North and South Carolina are going to do in the wake of Florence. Um, 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 neither state is an expansion state. Both states obviously have thousands and thousands of displaced people with no jobs and no insurance. Uh, whether they in fact approach the federal government about permission to put uh, an expansion into place for some period of time remains to be seen. Uh, uh, Medicaid, of course, is what enabled neonatal intensive care in the United States because it moved births in large numbers um, into hospital facilities and created the revenue stream um, they need. So we can go on and on and on, and there's always this question, well, why did we turn to Medicaid? And I think a good part of the reason is simply this very flexible federal financing structure. Uh, and, and part of the reason is the great difficulty, the great difficulty of enacting insurance reforms. We have all lived through this now. Um, where every, um, every effort to accommodate health risk um, in an insurance structure other than Medicaid is met with tremendous pushback. Uh, in fact, the reason we have Medicaid as the major mechanism for insuring the poor in the wake of the Affordable Care Act is twofold. One, uh, actually threefold. One was a general consensus that the coverage for the poor in Medicaid is more generous. Um, they can't afford premiums. They can't afford cost sharing. They need comprehensive benefits. Another reason uh, was simply the um, fact that the Medicaid benefit package, item for item, was one third less expensive than insuring people in the commercial insurance market. Uh, so a benefit package that would cost, say, $6,000 in Medic in, when financed through Medicaid would be $9,000 uh, in the commercial insurance market. Um, and the, the final reason why we have Medicaid as our major vehicle was because the private insurance industry insisted on it. We talk all the time, for those of you who follow uh, and the, all of the insurance litigation, for example, you know there's been a lot of litigation around premium stabilization. 
uh, risk corridors, um, uh, uh, reinsurance models, um, and ways to stabilize premiums. To a company, insurers will tell you that the most important premium stabilization tool they've got is Medicaid. It's much harder to run the marketplace in states that don't have Medicaid because the risk profile uh, of the marketplace is, uh, and the individual market as a result is, is, is much, uh, much shakier. So here we have this program that backstops everything. Um, that was flexible enough to absorb all of these tasks over five decades. Um, that was everybody's choice because of its relative generosity to the poor. Uh, at the same time, its ability to off to, to allow the rest of the healthcare system to offload risk. Um, and at the same time, nobody wants to be honest about, <laughs> about this, uh, you know. Uh, and, and so the fact that the program turned into this behemoth, which of course it is, it's now, I pro I'm sure for 2018 will easily surpass $600 billion in total funding. Um, if you want all of the data on Medicaid, the best source of data, there are two really great sources of data. One is the Medicaid and SHIP Payment and Access Commission, which is an advisory arm to Congress, uh, which I chaired for a number of years. Um, and the other uh, is the Kaiser Family Foundation, which has more data than you could possibly imagine about the Medicaid program. But it's huge, it's 75 million people. Uh, when I started Medicaid, I think we were, I think in the mid-70s, we were at about 9 or 10 million people, totally. So the growth has just been exponential. Uh, 600 billion in total federal and state spending, um, all of these jobs assigned to it, um, and it faces real challenges. Um, uh, the decision to grow Medicaid in the Affordable Care Act um, was, of course, the transformative piece that um, accompanied the, the companion growth uh, decisions that were made in the case of pediatrics and maternity care. Um, so in that sense, the, you know, the adult expansion was just sort of an extension of the reforms that began over the, over the course of the 80s. Um, but the, the, um, the point at which you were now having to manage what everybody could see was going to be in the mid-70 millions um, by, uh, by 2017 uh, is enormous because it's a heavily discounted payer. It covers people in medically underserved urban and rural communities where there's already an elevated incidence of poverty and a shortage of health professionals. Um, and uh, while it is structured to handle a lot, it needs a delivery system <clears throat> uh, that can function alongside it. And so this multiple year effort to, to deal with payment and um, quality transformation, which our entire healthcare system is involved with, um, has not had a more important presence than in Medicaid. Uh, I know um, um, Ohio has grappled with these questions. How do we take the dollars we have and make what we're buying more effective? How do we build delivery systems um, that can handle people with high health risks who face social conditions of health um, that, that, that both make health care all that more important while at the same time putting a terrible burden on health care? Uh, because it's dealing with people who are um, uh, in, in you know, relatively poor health. Um, uh, and so the, 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 the task was quite daunting. Um, the hope was that over many years, Medicaid, once it achieved this sort of insurance structure, um, uh, would then be allowed to innovate around delivery. Um, and that has meant, of course, enrolling the whole population in what we call managed care today. Really, everybody's enrolled in managed care. Very few people are not enrolled in, in sort of organized closed delivery systems, um, which look very different from our, um, our um, discounted insurance plans, our PPO plans. Um, because in Medicaid, if, you, if your delivery system can't get you the care, the chances are you're not going to get it. 
you don't have any capacity to buy out of out of network. Um, putting aside the terrible problem of things like surprise medical bills, um, uh, you know, the the fact is Medicaid beneficiaries never get surprised uh, because because if if their if their managed care plan doesn't do it, the chances are they don't they don't receive it. So these were the huge challenges, and everybody knew in the wake of the Affordable Care Act, trying to rationalize Medicaid's existence, trying to keep the growth trajectory under some control, um, would be the sort of the the, the force um, that would drive the program, or so we thought. Uh, and um, several things happened that threw us back into the kind of turmoil that the program began to face in the late 60s. It became evident to people right from the beginning that this program was growing faster than anybody thought it would. Um, by the mid-70s, states were throttling back. By the early 80s, by 81, we had, of course, the first existential um, uh, crisis of a block grant battle that almost succeeded. Uh, by mid-90s, we had the second round block grant battle that almost succeeded. And, of course, by 2017, we were back in the same battle. Uh, and this is, this, this whipsawing quality was what, um, what has ended up being uh, sort of the, 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 the calling card of this program. If you look carefully at the re so-called repeal and replace uh, uh, initiatives that we saw, the legislation that was passed in the House, uh, the bills that ended up going nowhere in the Senate, that was sort of the end of the, pro of the road, um, uh, you realize that while the efforts to shift insurance away from sort of a more risk-friendly model and back into a world of, um, of, of sort of limited products with segregated high risk pools for, for, for sicker people, which is really where, where Congress was going. In some ways, that was all sort of the hors d'oeuvres to what became the central, the central issue. Uh, and interestingly, once again, Congress was taught a lesson, which is you don't touch, this, you don't touch the Medicaid program. You might be able to sort of jigger the, the wheels for commercial insurance and move from uh, a unified pool into tiered pools um, and, and you know change the risk mitigation strategies, um, bring the rates down for younger, healthier people and, and, and offset the rise for, for older, sicker people. Do not couple that with a Medicaid block grant because what happened in Congress is largely the story of a Medicaid block grant that in the end convulsed the whole system, uh, the whole effort, and brought it down. Um, and what was so remarkable about, about this was truly the ignorance of Congress. Um, the fact that there were so few people in Congress, either the House or the Senate, who truly in appreciated the Medicaid program, who truly understood the program, who realized what they would unleash. Uh, there was a wonderful article in the, um, uh, in the Times at, ar around the passage in the House um, by two excellent Times reporters who wrote this breathless piece. It filled up an entire page uh, of the paper on the politics of Medicaid. People were all over describing what we had learned in 81 when the program was a fraction of itself, what we knew in 95 when the program was only at about 35 million people. Now you're talking about a program that was at seven, is at 75 million people. Um, and the proposal, quite simply, was to pull $3 trillion out of the program. Uh, and there, if you want to read the blueprint, such as it is, the blueprint was a document um, uh, uh, authored by uh, Speaker Paul Ryan. Uh, and um, the document was um, uh, called The Better Way. Some of you may have read this document. It's a 37-page document with this whole blueprint for everything, taxes, um, uh, 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 spending, social programs, social security, I mean, the works. Of that 37 pages, five 
were devoted to Medicaid. I mean, stop and think about it. The entire federal, um, the entire federal uh, uh, tax uh, and spending uh, landscape, and five of the 37 pages were on Medicaid, and that's because, of course, Medicaid was perceived as a program that nobody really cared about, as a program that really, if you just bad-mouthed it enough, if you called people able-bodied, if you called it welfare, if you said it was riddled with fraud, um, if you did all of these things, you could say this enough times, you could then couple that with rhetoric about state flexibility, and you could take a third of the federal financing away, which is what they did. And it became clear within moments of the publication of A Better Way, uh, and um, also within, uh, added to that were, was the position of um, uh, then Secretary Price that the ACA Medicaid expansions were in fact counter to public policy, which I, as I've told my students is the first time I've ever seen a Secretary of Health and Human Services say that an act of Congress was contrary to public policy, uh, but, but, but that, there, there you go, a clear departure from co the core historical mission of the program. So, you know, sort of this throwback to the English Poor Law of 1601, um, that that we're that Medicaid is only for the as they as they were known in Elizabethan times the impotent poor, uh, and that if the if the other poor were to get it it was to be a workhouse model, uh, and so a combination of very heated rhetoric, uh, and the um, you know the banner of flexibility, uh, uh, would get them through and would give them as it turned out this is what they really wanted the money to offset the 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 deficit caused by the, the tax reform law, uh, which is why they wanted to couple um, health reform with tax reform uh, to shift money from, from one, essentially from one account to another. Um, and they absolutely got their heads handed to them. I mean, it was just, it was a, a phenomenal battle, um, and the battle was not over, of course, until, until Senator McCain gave his, you know, his, his legendary thumbs down. Um, but what brought them down was, le was, was less, the thr less the, the commercial insurance reforms, although they were terrible, and they did stupid things like um, come up with a program where when the Congressional Budget Office ran the numbers, um, a 60-year-old uh, at twice poverty would go from paying, what was the figure, $1,400 a year for her insurance to $23,000 uh, because all of her subsidies would have disappeared and she would have been um, uh, essentially uh, put into a higher risk pool. Uh, so, you know, when you have stuff like that coming out about the commercial insurance reforms, you already have not done yourselves any favors. Um, but the true powerhouse became the, the Medicaid pushback. Uh, because this program is the DNA now of every state's healthcare system. It is the way in which Ohio is able to run an accessible healthcare system. Um, there is no hope here or anywhere else for taking these populations, these health conditions, these system needs, and tucking them somehow into a commercial insurance market. Um, and less hope of tucking them into Medicare. I, I assume I will go to my grave long before Medicare covers commercial, uh, covers long-term care. It just, nobody is willing to do the, 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 the financial restructuring needed to, to give Medicare that responsibility uh, because of the payroll tax. Uh, uh, and it won't be done as a Part B benefit uh, out of general revenue because it's just so, so massive. There was, of course, a willingness to shift prescription drugs from Medicaid to Medicare, um, but that had sort of a different trajectory and was, in the end, a more manageable benefit than shifting all of long-term services and supports for the elderly and for people with disabilities into Medicare. Um, the, where, where we stand now is, um, the, I would say, again, I will be um, a docent at the Smithsonian in my retirement before we see another run at Medicaid legislatively. Um, we, that's not to say that the program won't be the subject of legislative reforms. 
It has been the subject of legislative reforms hundreds of times over a half century. Um, but I think people came to appreciate once again um, just how, um, how fundamental Medicaid is, that it's not any of the things that were in a better way. Um, it, is not, it is not a handout for able-bodied people. Um, these labels mean nothing. They mean nothing to governors. They mean nothing to state legislatures. Even very conservative governors understand that these labels are, are, are meaningless. Um, I think our two, the two great challenges in Medicaid now come from different, at least the legal challenges, come from a different direction. One, of course, we are seeing now. You're seeing it here, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's its own um, uh, uh, great uh, um, sort of thunderstorm going on in D.C., um, and that is the misuse of federal demonstration powers. Um, uh, the, the Trump administration has staked out um, essentially the rollback of coverage through a variety of restrictions um, as its number one priority for the program using a demonstration authority that predates Medicaid uh, by three or four years. Um, and that was added to the law um, under the Kennedy administration in order to allow states and the federal government to experiment with ways to improve the performance of welfare programs. Um, and essentially that authority has now been turned on its head um, and is being used as a basis of authority um, uh, or an attempted basis of authority for changes in Medicaid that essentially roll back coverage. Um, and to date, we've had one approved demonstration, Kentucky's demonstration, and joined um, a second demonstration, Arkansas's demonstration, now challenged. Um, Kentucky never took effect. Arkansas took effect, and as everybody predicted, what the program is doing is not helping people find jobs. It is removing thousands of people a month from, from the program because they can't navigate um, the new system, not necessarily because they can't meet the requirements of the, of the, of the program. Um, uh, only today, as I was flying out here, I noticed that CMS Administrator Seema Verma has um, announced a new generation of approvals, so we're expecting new approvals, um, uh, and uh, they will attempt to get over the hurdle that they face in using this federal demonstration authority 1115, as it's known, um, which is that the secretary doesn't have authority to, 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 to undertake projects that undermine rather than promote the objectives of Medicaid. And the objective of Medicaid is to give people medical benefits. Um, so when you design demonstrations that only take medical benefits away, this is a problem, at least for the courts thus far. Um, we don't know what the new round of demos will look like. I suspect Ohio does have a, a, a proposal pending now, I think. Uh, and, and whether Ohio is going to be part of this new and improved generation of demonstrations and somehow uh, these new demonstrations will do what the other demonstrations did not do and somehow won't take benefits from people, um, we're all waiting to see. But she did say something very telling in her press count in her speech today, which is, um, in response to evidence that the cost of running these work programs and premium collection systems is turning out to be greater than the cost of giving people medical assistance, her answer is we'd rather invest in helping people get on their feet. So it doesn't seem that she has made the mental connection uh, to the federal court ruling earlier this year that helping people get on their feet is very nice, but that's not the purpose of Medicaid. The purpose of Medicaid is to give people who need it medical care. Uh, so that's one whole strain, um, the, the, this strange use of demonstration authority. Another huge issue, um, which, we are, which, which is about to be unleashed on all of us, um, is um, the public charge rule. Uh, I don't know how much people are following the public charge rule out here. We now, of course, have what is 
in theory, the near final version of the public charge rule. This, of course, is a rule issued by um, the Department of Homeland Security um, under longstanding authority uh, in, in federal law to deny admission or adjustment to permanent legal status of people who are public charges, uh, who are deemed to be public charges. Uh, and the administration takes the extraordinary position that it can count evidence of any receipt of any public benefit for sort of a, a period of time, of, uh, you know, uh, for over a period of months, as evidence that you are unable financially to support yourself and therefore are deemed a public charge and therefore can be denied um, adjustment of status uh, or denied admission to the U.S. Uh, it is an astounding rule. Um, the rule appears to me to be so blatantly unlawful given the fact that all of these programs allow lawfully resident people to get the benefits. In other words, the Department of Homeland Security is claiming that even though federal Medicaid law lets legal residents get Medicaid, or SNAP lets legal residents get, get food stamps, or um, uh, housing programs allow legal U.S. residents to get benefits, that even so, it has the authority to basically punish anybody who used the benefits um, by, uh, you know, in the most extreme version, deporting them. Um, entire uh, metropolitan areas in particular, but it's not just metropolitan areas, it's, it's, it's rural areas where there are millions um, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands to in some places, California, Texas, Florida, New York, millions of people um, who use these public benefits um, who will simply drop the benefit. Obviously, it's not, in their view, worth the risk of, um, of, of, of not being able to stay in the U.S. In the earlier iteration of this rule, um, the Department of Homeland Security proposed to also count the receipt of benefits by citizen children living with legally resident people um, as evidence of public charge. Um, that appears to have been dropped, but all studies suggest that the deterrent effect of these rules is such that we will see entire communities where people just simply walk away from insurance, walk away from food, um, and of course, it doesn't even stop with the benefits that are clearly identified in the rule. The word goes out in communities that essentially anything that's public you don't want to go to. Uh, so already, of course, clinics around the country, public hospitals around the country, uh, community service programs around the country are reporting tremendous fear um, and tremendous you know, going underground. The, the, the rule is unbelievably complicated. Um, I've just spent, I can't tell you how many hours this week on this rule, and I can barely understand it. The easiest thing for families to do who are immigrants is simply stay far away from public programs. Um, and that's what they will be told. They will be told, don't risk it. Don't risk it for yourselves, don't risk it for your spouses, don't risk it for your children. Uh, and so, uh, and Medicaid becomes the leading edge of this along with SNAP. Um, because they're such large programs and because the significance of losing all these people um, uh, from the program becomes great. So uh, what we will see is a lot of effort regulatorily to drive people off the program. Um, you know, mercifully, um, we're talking regulatorily, uh, so um, there's a chance that someday uh, the people who are in the driver's seat uh, determining the regulations um, will be gone. Uh, or at least won't be able to put these rules out anymore. Um, but I think the, the point to leave you with, um, and then open it up for questions, is that we're talking about a program that is not a marginal English Elizabethan program for the poor. It is the foundation on which our entire healthcare system rests at this point, huge chunks of it. Uh, and so um, keeping Medicaid um, and growing it and learning to manage it well and effectively becomes probably the greatest act of solidarity we can make as a country, at least where health policy is concerned. So why don't I stop and 
open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, since we are being webcast or will be webcast, uh, you need to uh, ask your questions using a microphone. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and we will bring you a microphone. Hi, um, I'm a 1L here at Case, so thank you for coming. Um, my question is, you said that um, private companies really pushed for the creation of Medicare or Medicaid. Medicaid. <coughs> What are they doing to try and protect it if they're doing anything at all? Yeah, they're generally, the insurance companies, um, you know, as I pointed out, have this huge self-interest in the program. Um, they are very strong advocates for the program generally. Um, uh, so, for example, um, whether it's Kaiser's Washington, D.C. office or America's Health Insurance Plans or United, the, the big guys, Cigna, they are very strong proponents of the Medicaid program, um, uh, in many ways much stronger proponents of Medicaid often than, than health care providers and professionals are themselves. Um, one of the more unfortunate issues, I don't know if this became an issue here in Ohio, um, but but not with a governor who was as decisive as as uh, as, as your governor was. Um, in a lot of places, what held up the Medicaid expansion, which of course became effectively optional in 2012 uh, under the Sebelius decision, what often held up the expansion um, was that hospitals, um, which often pay a provider tax. A lot of healthcare providers now pay a provider tax. This helps fund um, uh, uh, Medicaid and other healthcare programs. It's a sales tax, essentially. Um, were very mixed about their willingness to support um, the expansion because in states without expanded Medicaid programs, hospitals tend to get, in fact, much higher loading rates uh, of pay um, in states with a broad Medicaid base in the patient population, the rates probably get throttled back. And so there's been a, you know, some um, uh, unease um, in the provider world. And of course, physicians have tended to be quite mixed. Pediatricians are incredible. They've been incredible for Medicaid and CHIP because, quite frankly, we're talking about the whole pediatric system. Uh, obstetricians and gynecologists have been very forceful on Medicaid because it's the entire maternity system. Um, but special, specialty practices, not so much because the rates tend to be much, much lower. Although I will say parenthetically that at least back east now, it's almost as hard finding a specialist to see a Medicare patient uh, as Medicaid. So they're, they're, the insurers are quite enthusiastic. Um, anything to not have to fold people with that kind of health profile in their view into their risk pool. Yeah. And its incredible impact on getting these 75 million people yep. to try uh, if they to have an insurance card and you know the, the promise of insurance but without adequate uh, provider payments, it's, it's really an illusion. And so what, what kind of efforts are being made to rectify that? Yeah, it's a huge problem for the program. Um, I have, quite frankly, very limited expectations that on the specialty side of things, there will ever be a big solution. I think one of the great built-in inequities in healthcare um, is that there are many kinds of specialty services that poor people just don't get. They don't get it. Uh, and um, when you see the, the payments that specialists can command, I mean, particularly Washington, of course, is a mecca for this, uh, as I'm sure, you know, your large city, and so is Cleveland. Um, it is very, very hard if you need to find a rheumatologist, if you need to find uh, um, any sort of a specialist, a neurologist, a psychiatrist. Um, 
we have a study now underway actually for the Commonwealth Fund to look at primary care. Um, and what we are finding is that very, that states have targeted primary care for delivery and payment reforms that include more advantageous payments, um, a system of preferred payments, bonuses, things that tie, you know, what we call value purchasing, which is, of course, something that's happening across the healthcare system. Even so, I recognize that as very different from just a base rate. That's that's a competitive base rate. Um, and it, it, it the consequences are quite serious. I mean, it's Medicaid's biggest problem. It would work fine as, a, as, a, as an insurance program uh, if it could pay competitive rates. Uh, and uh, uh, states are aware of it. Um, managed care companies are aware of it. Uh, and um, uh, you know, if, if I could wave a magic wand and fix one thing about the program, that's what it would be. But but the problem is the lure of this one third discount. You know, literally a third. Nobody will spend money on the poor that it takes to get the program up. Arkansas, interestingly, of course, tried a version of taking taking the Medicaid population and enrolling them instead in qualified health plans in the marketplace. And they report quite good access experience um, and, uh, and, 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 and other kinds of beneficial results. Arkansas, I predict, will never be repeated because the federal government will never be snookered again into doing Arkansas because the program, although Arkansas would argue strongly, and I, I'm a great admirer of what they've done, um, our, uh, the federal government feels that it got played, you know, uh, that it's, it's spending a lot more money in the Arkansas demonstration than it would be spending per capita in a straight up Medicaid expansion. Yes, thank you for all the advocacy over the decades for the program. Uh, I was wondering about what percentage of the Medicaid dollars go into the long-term nursing home care, and if there's a lot of political pushback uh, uh, to, for any retrenchment as a result of that component. So long-term care is now about half the program. And of course, the, the proportion of people getting long-term care, and I include children and adults, adults okay, uh, long-term services and supports, um, is much smaller than that. But, you know, at one level, it's shocking. At another level, it's what you would expect, right? We would expect that spending on the sickest people with the most extensive long-term care needs would be far higher. Interestingly, though, a lot of that expenditure, at least for those people who you have Medicaid for everything, say children with disabilities um, or, or, or adults on SSI who have no earnings history so they never went to work so they're strictly cared for through Medicaid. A lot of the excess cost for that, those populations is actually for what is known as their acute care costs. They use more hospital care, more physician care, more prescription drugs um, because everybody's trying to make an effort to keep them in the community um, and not, you know, in long-term care institutional settings. Uh, but there is no question that long-term services and supports, whether inpatient or outpatient, are very expensive. And Medicaid will be the way we fund it forever and ever um, because nobody else can see a pathway. The Affordable Care Act tried to build what turned out to be a very weak long-term care insurance option uh, into, um, into, into federal law. And they just could not, unless it's made a compulsory part of our payroll tax system, it's, it's impossible to get people to buy the product and therefore it, you know, it craters. Uh, any premium-based system would, so. Hello, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. In this country, about between 1 and 3 percent, depending who are you looking at, um, whose uh, publications are you looking at. But anyway, it's an abysmal 1 to 3 percent of the medical care is spent on preventive services. 
since Medicaid is so much um, targeted to uh, children and women's and um, services, and since uh, the access to specialties is so scarce, if at all, uh, what percentage of the Medicaid goes to preventive services? It's a, it's a tiny fraction, but interestingly, national studies of utilization of care show absolute parity between poor people on Medicaid and other people in terms of use of preventive services. In other words, a child on Medicaid is as likely as a child with private insurance to have checkups, uh, immunizations, uh, uh, and, and what that tells us, it tells us one of two things. Either the entire population is not getting the preventive services it's supposed to get, um, or as tough as it is to get subspecialty care, particularly pediatrics, um, Medicaid's coverage, of course, for children is extraordinary. The so the so-called EPSDT program, uh, which is a very old part of Medicaid, very comprehensive coverage with no cost sharing, and um, if states do well in terms of continuity of care. Uh, and the continuum from preventive to, 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 to very advanced, it tends to be for the EPSDT population. Um, adults, um, a lot of the studies, the post-ACA studies in the Medicaid expansion states um, show that as adults acquired Medicaid, one of the first things they went looking for was preventive care. So, you know, it's not because they're not eager to use it, it may be access issues as well. But the, the data on utilization probability is actually quite good for Medicaid, or quite bad for everybody else. What do you see as the future for uh, the pre-existing condition rule? Uh, uh, well, this is, the, this is the problem with private insurance and reform. You can do a lot and claim that you've preserved the pre-existing condition exclusion. In other words, um, you could do a lot of damage. So the, 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 there are, you know, in theory, a couple of ways to deal with people who have pre-existing condition exclusions. One, of course, is to build a very, very strong, stable commercial insurance risk pool um, that is big enough and robust enough and backstopped enough so everybody can come in and buy, which was the aim of the Affordable Care Act. Let's just do what it takes to build strong insurance. Uh, and the individual market is always going to be a little wobbly, but there are a lot of things we can do, uh, both in, in, in attracting young people and having affordable premiums on the one hand and backstopping on the other. So that's one vision. Another vision, of course, is the vision of repeal and replace which is let's make it impossible for um, people with pre-existing conditions to get into the basic risk pool. Let's instead put them in a separate pool. And of course the problem with that model is that you make the care unbearably expensive for people in the risk pool. It's the whole reason why states tried risk pools and abandoned them because you, you can't have an affordable system when you segment the market this way. Um, uh, now, there are things that states are trying, I don't know whether it's been tried in Ohio, um, to make it much more possible to have a unified risk pool that's open to everybody, the biggest one being a reinsurance uh, program um, uh, that, that essentially offloads, that and risk corridors, to offload the highest costs of the pool onto a reinsurer, um, which is typically the <laughs> the government, plus some private funds mixed in. Um, and that's what Medicare Advantage does, it's what the Medicare Prescription Drug Program does. Um, and that was the theory of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but unfortunately, the, it's not clear to me that when, when um, um, people talk about preserving the protections of pre-existing condition exclusion bans, their meaning make it possible for everybody to get a good quality product at an affordable price in the same, you know, no wrong door, essentially. Uh, I would say, though, after the debacle of last summer um, and the degree to which people were really just pummeled, uh, and as I mentioned, the CBO chart, um, uh, where, you know, it's $20,000 for a 60-year-old to buy a policy uh, uh, compared to 
14 or 1700 today. I, I just don't know whether people have an appetite to try this again or whether what they'll do is put more tools out there for states to deal with it on their own. But I would not I would I would trust the state reforms on this much more than the federal. So uh, we've come to the end of our time. Please join me in giving a round of applause to our speakers. I have a I have a an award for you which commemorates that you are the 2018 I can't get it out. 19 Schroeder Lecturer. Oh, beautiful. Uh, and uh, please join us outside for refreshments. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And it's heavy, so we can send it Oh, yeah, you. I think so. That would be lovely. Okay. And it's beautiful. Thank you. Plus, I got all the things that were in my room. Oh, yeah, I heard about it. A bag. It. Yeah. They wouldn't check me in because because they said, no, no, we have a special room for you. It's got to get the bag <laughs> Well, thank you. That was excellent. How you managed to do that extemporaneously without reading your PowerPoint slides is amazing.